So I must say that I believe we stand about where, uh, in good company today, in halls such as this, where your predecessors, where Dave Dubinsky himself actually stood, where another former president stood and fought this issue out of Social Security against the same charges. This argument that the government should stay out, that it saps our pioneer stock. I used to hear that argument when we were talking about raising the minimum wage to a dollar and a quarter. I remember one day uh, being asked to step out into the hall. And up the corridor came four distinguished looking men with straw hats on and canes. They told me they had just flown in from a state in their private plane. And they wanted me to know that if we passed a bill providing for time and a half, for service station attendants who were then working about 55 to 60 hours at straight time, it would sap their self-reliance. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, what saps anyone's self-reliance is working 60 hours at straight time or working at 85 or 95 or a dollar an hour. <laughs> All depending upon filling out a pauper's oath and going uh, and then getting it free. Nobody in this hall is asking for it for nothing. They are willing to contribute during their working years. That is the important principle which has been lost sight of. I understand that there's going to be a program this week against this bill in which an English physician is going to come and talk about how bad their plans are. It, it may be, but he ought to talk about it in England because his plan his plan and what they do in England is entirely different. In England, the entire cost of medicine for people of all ages, all of it, doctors, the choice of doctors, hospitals, from the time you're born to the time you die, are included in a government program. But what we're talking about is entirely different. And I hope that while he's here, he and Dr. Spock and others who have joined us will come to see what we're trying to do. The fact of the matter is that what we are now talking about doing, most of the countries of Europe did years ago. The British did it 30 years ago. We are behind every country pretty nearly in Europe in this matter of medical care for our citizens. And then those who say that this should be left to private effort. In those hospitals in New Jersey, where the doctors said they wouldn't treat anyone who paid their hospital bills through Social Security, those hospitals and every other new hospital, the American people, all of us, contribute one half, one or two thirds for every new hospital, the national government. We pay 55% of all the research done. We help young men become doctors. We are concerned with the progress of this country. And those who say that what we are now talking about spoils our great pioneer heritage should remember that the West was settled with two great actions by the national government. One, in President Lincoln's administration, when he gave a homestead to everyone who went West, and in 1862, he set aside government property to build our land-grant colleges. This cooperation between an alert and progressive citizenry and a progressive government is what has made this country great, and we shall continue as long as we have the opportunity to do so. <laughs> this matter should not be left to a mail campaign where senators are inundated, or congressmen, 25 and 30,000 letters. The instructions go out, write it in your own hand. Don't use the same words. The letters pour in in two or three weeks. Half of them misinformed. This meeting today, on a hot, good day, when everyone could be doing something else and the 32 other meetings, this indicates that the American people are determined to put an end to meeting a challenge which hits them at a time when they're least able to meet it. And then finally, I had a letter last week saying, you're going to take care of all the millionaires and they don't need it. I do not know 
how many millionaires we are talking about, but they won't mind contributing $12 a month to Social Security, and they may be among those who will apply for it when they go to the hospital, but what I will say is that the national government, through the tax laws, already takes care of them, because over 65, they can deduct all their medical expenses. What we are concerned about is the person, not who has not got a cent, but those who saved and worked and then get hit. Then there are those who say, well, what happens if you die before you're 65? Well, there isn't, you really don't care. You have no guarantees, but what we are talking about is our people are living a long time, their housing is inadequate, in many cases their rehabilitation is inadequate, We've got great unfinished business in this country. And while this bill does not solve our problems in this area, I do not believe it is a valid argument to say this bill isn't going to do the job. It will not, but it will do part of it. Our housing bill last year for the elderly, that won't do the job, but it will begin. When we retrain workers, that won't take care of unemployment chronically in some areas, but it's a start. We don't aren't able overnight to solve all the problems that this country faces. But is that any good reason why we should say, let's not even try? That's what we're going to do today. We are trying. We are trying. And what we're talking about here is true in a variety of other ways. All the great revolutionary movements of the Frank and Roosevelt administration in the 30s we now take for granted. But I refuse to see us live on the accomplishments of another generation. I refuse to see this country and all of us shrink from these struggles, which are our responsibility in our time, because what we are now talking about in our children's day will seem to be the ordinary business of government. I come here today as a citizen asking you to exert the most basic power which is contained in the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence, the right of a citizen to petition his government. And I ask your support in this effort. This effort will be successful. And it will be successful because it is soundly based to meet a great national crisis and it is based on the effort of responsible citizens. So I want to commend you for being here. I think it's most appropriate that the President of the United States, whose business place is in Washington, should come to this city and participate in these rallies because the business of government is the business of the people, and the people are right here. In closing, uh, let me say that on this issue and many others, uh, we depend upon your help. This is the only way we can secure action to keep this country moving ahead, to have places to educate our children, to have decent housing, to do something about the millions of young children who leave our schools before they graduate. Every day I am reminded of how many things were left undone. 30 years ago, they provided that no drugs be put on the market which were unsafe for hogs and for cattle. We want to take the radical step of doing the same for human beings. Anyone who says that Woodrow Wilson, as great a president as he was, and Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, that they did it all, and we have nothing left to do, now are wrong. We ask you, the citizens of this country, the responsible and thoughtful doctors, the hospital administrators, all those who face this challenge of educating our children, finding work for our older people, finding security for those who have retired, all who are committed to this great effort of moving this country forward, come and give us your help.